Hello everybody, this is Mr. Coker and welcome to the twelfth and final module of the semester and this will be the last module of your Chem 2's Chem 106 class. Um, this module is about proteins and nucleic acids so it's biochemistry. Uh, bear with me, I'm not as good at biochemistry as I am at um, inorganic chemistry but I will uh, do my best here to uh, say things accurately and to uh, talk to you about proteins and nucleic acids. Uh, proteins and nucleic acids are both polymers. Proteins are polymers made up of monomers called amino acids. So on the screen here you see the 20 amino acids that are used to make the proteins in our bodies. Um, the uh, order at which these amino acids are attached to each other is very important for the uh, the work of a particular protein in the body and so your body needs a way to keep track of how to make these proteins and that's where the nucleic acids come in. So nucleic acids like DNA and RNA are, uh, nu um, are polymers of monomers called nucleotides and the nucleotide order in the DNA and the RNA encodes uh, the order of the amino acids for the proteins. So we are going to get into that in this module. So we talk about biological polymers. There are many biological molecules that are polymers. Um, one of the most versatile are the proteins and proteins have many different functions within our body. They are polymers of amino acids. And so the 20 amino acids on the previous slide are the um, are the beads in the uh, in the chain uh, so to speak for a polypeptide or a protein. So a protein is a big long chain. It's made up of individual uh, pieces or monomers called amino acids. Other biological po uh, polymers include the nucleic acids, DNA, double-stranded, and RNA, single-stranded. And uh, they contain monomers called nucleotides. We've also seen in previous uh, module that um, carbohydrates can be um, polymers, polymers like starch or glycogen and or cellulose and they are made up of simple sugars. Simple sugars are the monomers that string together to make the carbohydrates. And then fatty acids can attach to glycerol, three fatty acids on a glycerol molecule to make um, lipids. And so uh, fatty acids could be considered the monomer and lipids could be considered the polymer in that case. So you can see there are many different bio if we look at the functions of proteins, uh, proteins have many functions, um, structural, enzymes, transport, motion, regulation, storage, defense, and these are some examples of um, various ways the proteins would be used for these, uh, for these uses. Um, you might be careful on the homework and make sure that when you're doing the mastering chemistry you actually use the terminology for these functions that is used in the textbook. Um, Cheryl has changed up some of them for example what she calls motion, the book calls con contractile. Um, instead of calling it regulation the book I think calls regulation hormone um, regulation proteins, it calls it hormones. Um, so just be aware that um, there are um, slightly different names for some of these that are used by the textbook. So just have your textbook handy when you're doing your homework. It's important to know the functions. You do not have to be able to come up with specific examples, but you should know the various functions of proteins on this list. So let's talk about these um, monomers that are the building blocks of proteins. They're called amino acids. They have a specific uh, structure to them um, and all the amino acids, all 20 of the amino acids have the same basic parts. So if we start with a central carbon in the center of the amino acid, um, on one side it's going to have a carboxylic acid group. Remember carboxylic acids are C double bonded OOH, spelled Q C O O H uh, here. So that is always one part of an amino acid. On the other side of the amino acid, you're always going to have the amino group. That's why they call it amino acid, because you have the amine and you have the carboxylic acid on every uh, amino acid. The amine group will be NH2. Uh, 
uh, so you have NH2 on one side and COH on the other. You'll have a hydrogen attached to the central carbon and then you'll have various side chains. So the only part that is different among the 20 different amino acids is the side chain. So there are 20 different side chains that may be attached to the central carbon. And if you notice here, as long as the side chain isn't hydrogen, this should be a chiral uh, molecule because the carbon is attached to four different things. Some examples of amino acids. The simplest amino acid would be glycine because the side chain is simply a hydrogen. And so this is the only amino acid that is not chiral because it has two hydrogens attached to the central carbon instead of four different things. Another simple amino acid would be the one where the R side group is um, a methyl group, a CH3. That's called alanine. You don't have to know the specific names, but you should know that there are different side chains and that makes up the different amino acids. Uh, how many chiral carbons would you say are in alanine? So looking at this molecule, how many chiral carbons do you see? The answer is one. The central carbon is attached to four different things, and that is the chiral carbon is the central carbon. Um, as you know, um, things that are chiral can be like left-handed and right-handed. Um, all the naturally occurring amino acids are in the L form. The types of amino acids are classified much the same way that we classified our uh, functional groups when we did our drug project. You can classify the side chains as nonpolar or polar, uh, or hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Hydrophobic, nonpolar, hydrophilic, polar. Um, nonpolar side chains will be dominated by carbon and hydrogen. Uh, polar side chains will have electronegative elements like oxygen or nitrogen or sulfur on them. Um, so this can affect the way that the amino acids are able to interact with each other when they're on the uh, protein chain. So in this particular example we have alanine as a nonpolar and serine as a polar um, based on the nature of their side chain. Uh, side chains can also be acidic or basic. If there's a carboxyl group, COOH, they'll be acidic. Or if there's a basic group, NH2, um, amine, then they will be uh, basic. But those are the um, two kinds of side chains that you could have. Otherwise, if they don't have carboxyl for acidic or amine for basic, then they are neutral. Um, it's important to note here, if it's acidic or basic, it will definitely be hydrophilic. And Acidic and basic are both polar, and so they're both hydrophilic. Um, now, there's some uh, interesting things in the way that the uh, amino acids are drawn on this particular slide that's different from the amino acids that you saw on the previous slide. You may have picked up on it. It's the charges and the position of the hydrogen. Um, if we uh, focus on the blue box for alanine, uh, in the previous slides, we would have seen alanine with NH2 on the left and COOH on the right. Well, COOH is an acid and NH2 is a base. And so COOH should want to give H plus and NH2 should want to take H plus. And so in this particular drawing, they've done that. They've taken the H plus for the acid off of COOH and put it on the NH2 and made it NH3 plus. So this makes a negative charge at the COO uh, that has lost the H plus and a positive charge at the NH2, NH3 that has gained the H plus. Um, this is a funny word, but when you draw an amino acid in this form where you've moved the H plus from the acid over to the amino side, uh, to the amine side, it's called the Zwitter ion, and it's actually spelled Z W I T T E R I O N. That's a real word, Zwitter ion. And so the Zwitter ion form of an amino acid has moved the H plus from the acid end over to the um, uh, amine or basic side. 
It's uh, donated the H plus and accepted the H plus. So acidic and basic are always hydrophilic. The basic end is um, NH2 side chains and acidic would be the carboxyl group. These are, out of the 20 amino acids, these are the 20 that are considered nonpolar. Uh, so notice that except for methionine and for tryptophan, all of the side chains contain only carbon and hydrogen. Yes, we have a benzene ring and but that's for phenylalanine, but that's also considered a carbon hydrogen uh, ring. A methionine does have a sulfur. Um, but in general, it's still considered a nonpolar side chain. And tryptophan does have a nitrogen, but it is also considered a nonpolar side chain. Uh, you don't need to memorize the names or the structures of the various um, nonpolar amino acids, but if shown a picture with a side chain of carbons and hydrogens, you should, you should be able to say that it is a nonpolar amino acid. The polar amino acids that are neutral, neither acid nor base, are the, uh, the six on the screen here. Uh, notice some of the things that make them polar for the first three. They're polar because they have the OH, the hydroxyl or the alcohol side uh, as part of their side chain. Cysteine has a thiol, an SH, as part of its side chain. It's also uh, considered polar. Um, asparagine or gene and glutamine uh, have amide groups or C double bonded O and H2 groups as their as part of their side chain and those are also considered uh, polar amino acids but they're neither acid nor base. The acidic and basic amino acids are the ones with a carboxylic acid group or an amine group on the side chain. And so aspartic acid and glutamic acid on the left here, uh, those have the acidic uh, form, the COOH. Actually, the H plus has been taken off. Remember, this is the Zwitter ion form. And then the histidine, lysine, and arginine are the, um, are the examples where they have uh, um, amine groups uh, or nitrogen, hydrogen uh, groups. So, let's take a look at a couple of amino acids, A and B here, and see if you can identify whether they are polar or nonpolar. Uh, do you think glycine is polar, one, or nonpolar, two? And then threonine, is it polar or nonpolar? If you picked glycine to be nonpolar, you are correct. The side chain hydrogen does not contain any oxygen, sulfur, or nitrogen, so it's considered nonpolar. Uh, the threonine, you should have picked that to be polar due to the OH group on the side chain of the threonine makes it polar. How do two amino acids link together to start a chain of amino acids? All of the linkages that make up a chain of amino acids involve something called a peptide or an amide bond. Uh, notice that we have two amino acids here. Uh, we have a glycine and an alanine. Um, the glycine on the left has a carboxyl group, a C double bonded O, OH. And the um, alanine on the right has, and I'm, I'm talking about the two molecules on top here, has a, um, an NH2 amino group. Of course, they both have amino and carboxyl groups. But if you line up the carboxyl group of one with the amine group of the other, by removing water, which consists of the OH on the carboxyl group and the hydrogen from the amine group. By removing water, we can create a linkage with the C double bonded O from the left um, amino acid and the NH from the right amino acid linking to each other. This is very similar to um, making an ester out of an alcohol and a carboxylic acid group. Um, and you end up with something called a peptide bond or an amide bond with a C double bonded O NH linking the two amino acids to each other. So you're using the carboxyl group that every amino acid has with the amine group that every amino acid has. You're using one from one and one from the other to make a peptide bond. 
Um, also water is formed by this reaction and so it's called a dehydration. We're taking out water, we're dehydrating, we're taking out water to make this reaction work. Now you don't just put two together, you can put these together in chains that are hundreds or thousands of amino acids long uh, because you still have on the right um, carboxyls and on the left amine groups even after linking two together you, you can still continue the chain by using the carboxyl on the right and the amine on the left you can keep growing the chain longer. There are four levels to protein structure and you should learn the four levels of protein structure. Um, the first level of protein structure is called the primary structure and that is the actual sequence or order to which the amino acids are put together. For example, if you have glycine followed by alanine followed by threonine, gly, lyse, three, then that order is considered the primary structure to the amino acid. Um, since every amino acid has the same basic backbone with a C double bonded O NH um, occurring everywhere two amino acids linked together, uh, the C double bonded O NH portion of the backbone is in fact polar and so you can get the backbone of the amino acid chain linking to itself, doubling back on itself and linking up using the polarity of those amide bonds. Um, if that happens that is called the secondary structure. Uh, so using hydrogen bonding between different parts of the backbone is called secondary structure. Tertiary structure is when you use uh, interactions like hydrogen bonding or other kinds of uh, maybe ion ion attractions or other kinds of interactions between side chains. So if you are using the R groups of the amino acids on the in the chain to cause the chain to fold and and uh, connect to itself, um, then that's called tertiary structure. For example, perms and hair use the tertiary structure, use the side chains to get things to to uh, attract each other. Then finally the quaternary structure is the fourth level of protein structure and it's actually when you take more than one um, polymer chain of amino acids and you allow them to interact with each other. And so instead of one single chain interacting with itself, maybe we have two chains that um, fold together and then they somehow have a way of which they connect to each other. And that's called quaternary structure. Uh, for this class you do not need to learn the two main kinds of secondary structure called the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet or any kind of specifics besides what's currently here on this um, uh, slide. You should know what primary is, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary mean. Um, because secondary, tertiary, and quaternary uh, protein structures are weak intermolecular type interactions, they aren't covalent bonds, they're things like hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole attractions. Um, because they aren't full-fledged bonds, they're sort of weak attractions that can occur between side chains or the backbone of the uh, protein structures they are those um, attractions can be easily broken by various environmental factors such as heat or um, if the protein is exposed to some certain organic compounds that can disrupt the bonds acids and bases high pH low pH can disrupt the bonds heavy metal ions like lead or cadmium or mercury um, those could disrupt the bonds or simply agitation if the molecule gets shaken uh, in such a way that it sort of loosens up those bonds that can affect the uh, the way in which the protein folds and if you affect the way the protein folds you change its shape and its form if you change its form you can affect its function so this is important um, that we realize that proteins are fairly fragile and that they they're the way in which they interact with themselves and with each other um, involve these rather weak attractive forces and if you put a protein in just in too um, radical of a uh, chemical or physical environment 
you can um, you can definitely uh, uh, disrupt the bonds. For example, cooking an egg involves denaturing the proteins in the egg yolk and the uh, egg whites. You're heating it and um, if you want scrambled eggs, of course, you're agitating it. You're using a whisk to agitate and break down those um, uh, protein protein uh, interactions. And so uh, be aware that these kinds of conditions can be bad on proteins. If it's uh, denaturing the protein, it's going to affect the function of the protein, which could cause disease or in the cell or the organism. Uh, one very important use of proteins in the body is as enzymes. Enzymes are a biological catalyst. Remember back when we studied about um, uh, chemical reactions, we talked about how to make two chemicals react, they have to collide with each other with enough energy to break the bonds in the molecules and reform bonds in the products. For example, if carbon dioxide and water in this diagram want to collide and become H2CO3, there will be, during the collision, a conversion of the energy of the collision to break some bonds. So that will raise the potential energy of the system. So the purple um, curve here represents the normal way in which carbon dioxide and water would need to collide. They would have to overcome a high energy barrier, meaning a lot of the collisions between carbon dioxide and water would not work. They just wouldn't have enough energy in the collision to get over the hump to get over to H2CO3. However, a catalyst, like maybe a protein in the form of an enzyme, could lower that activation energy or that um, energy barrier that's needed to get from carbon dioxide and water over to H2CO3. And so we might have the green pathway. So a lot more of the collisions could get over the smaller hill than, and would have enough energy to get up and over the smaller hill to the H2CO3. So this would increase the rate at which carbon dioxide and water could form carbonic acid. By lowering the energy of activation, more of the collisions are successful and it increases the rate. So a catalyst or an enzyme in the cell has a basic structure where it has um, uh, these long protein chains, these long amino acid chains called proteins, but it has a specific area of that folded protein that has um, a certain shape. And the shape of that area um, is just right to fit the um, shape of a substrate, a molecule that you want to react in a certain way. So here we show a basic diagram of a substrate consisting of a green part and a blue part. And let's say the reaction you want to do on this substrate is you want to break it into two parts, a green and a blue. So this would be similar to digestion in the, uh, in the body. We're digesting molecules. Uh, enzymes are often used for digesting uh, food. And so what we need is an enzyme that's going to have a, a fit to this substrate. And so the enzyme has a certain area of the enzyme called an active site. And just like two puzzle pieces, the substrate fits into the active site. The enzyme then binds to the substrate using its R groups, uh, its side chains, and the various amino acids that are part of the enzyme. Those side chains interact with the substrate, weakening the bond between the green and the blue. And so then the green and the blue can split apart and then become two separate uh, molecules. Uh, so we've digested the substrate. We've broken down the substrate into simpler molecules that the body can use more easily. So the area at which the substrate attaches and which um, bonds to the substrate is called the active site of the enzyme. Um, so the enzyme will attach to the substrate and then uh, the products will uh, detach from the, sub from the enzyme and so we've performed a reaction. So another way to diagram it would be in an enzyme catalyzed reaction the substrate attaches to the active site you could say E plus S yields ES that's actually an equilibrium between the enzyme and the substrate and then the, that forms something called an enzyme substrate complex ES so the enzyme and the substrate are one thing now 
and then the reaction occurs where the substrate breaks into green and blue in this particular diagram and the products are released by the enzyme so it becomes E plus P. Notice we're back to E we're back to the same form of the enzyme as before the reaction so the enzyme is not used up it can be used over and over again it's a catalyst. So since enzymes are uh, proteins they can be denatured by various um, environmental conditions and so enzymes need to work over a very narrow range of conditions of pH and temperature also the substrate concentration needs to be in a certain range and the enzyme concentration needs to be in a certain range in order to get the proper rate of reaction that the cell needs um, in order to function one of the things that can affect the ability of an enzyme to work is something called uh, inhibition. So if there are molecules around that can inhibit or slow down the work of the enzyme, uh, you can have an inhibitor. Um, and one kind of inhibitor is called a competitive inhibitor. A competitive inhibitor mimics or tries to match the shape of the substrate and so here we see the orange substrate and the purple inhibitor. Notice they have a similar shape to them at, at the part of the molecule that attaches to the enzyme. And so instead of the substrate attaching to the enzyme, if the inhibitor is around, it will attach to the enzyme. And as a, as a result, it blocks the substrate from being able to attach to the enzyme. When the inhibitor is on the enzyme, the substrate cannot attach. Uh, one way to, um, to look for whether or not this is happening or not is to increase the substrate concentration which will increase its ability to compete with the inhibitor for the enzyme. So if you increase the substrate concentration and you end up getting more reactions occurring that's telling you that you have a competitive inhibitor um, that, is, um, that is blocking your enzyme from being able to work. A second way of inhibition is something called a non-competitive inhibitor. A non-competitive inhibitor does not look like the substrate. In fact, it has a different shape and it doesn't even bind to the active site. It would bind to another place on the enzyme. But when it binds to that place on the enzyme, it changes the shape of the enzyme and changes the shape of the uh, active site. By changing the shape of the active site, we've now made the active site no longer compatible with the substrate and so it distorts the enzyme in such a way that the substrate can no longer attach. This is called non-competitive inhib inhibition and increasing the concentration of the substrate does not help because you're not competing for the same place on the enzyme. The substrate is attaching to the active site, the non-competitive inhibitor is attaching elsewhere and so increasing concentration of the substrate does not affect the rate if you have non-competitive inhibition. Now some things you don't need to know about uh, proteins are uh, anything in section 16.8, uh, things about naming peptides and naming enzymes you do not need to know. Moving on to chapter 17 on nucleic acids like RNA and DNA. These are molecules that store information for cellular growth and reproduction. Uh, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, ribonucleic acid are both large molecules. They're long chains or polymers and they are chains of monomers. The monomers are called nucleotides. A nucleotide has three parts to it and this would be true for a DNA nucleotide and also an RNA nucleotide. In fact, they have many similar um, nucleotides that they use. Um, in the center of the nucleotide, you have a pentose sugar or a five carbon sugar. Notice the numbers on the yellow sugar, one, two, three, four, and five. That's the five carbon sugar. Um, you will also have a nitrogen containing base uh, these differ from one nucleotide to another and so it's the base that determines the identity of your nucleotide just like the R side chain determined the identity of an amino acid the base the nitrogenous contain uh, base or the nitrogen containing base 
determines the identity of the um, nucleotide. And then all the nucleotides will contain a PO4, which is a phosphate group. So you have a phosphate attached to a pentose sugar attached to a nitrogenous base. These make up the various nu uh, nucleotides. There are five main nucleotides uh, used by DNA and RNA. Uh, three of them are called pyrimidines. There is a cytosine, a thymine, and a uracil. The cytosine and thymine are used for DNA. Uh, cytosine is also used for RNA, but uracil is used only in RNA, and thymine is used only in DNA. Notice uracil and thymine are almost identical. Thymine has an extra CH3, but uh, they basically perform the same function as each other, but thymine does it in DNA and uracil does it in RNA. And then you have your purines. Uh, the purines are adenine and guanine. Uh, these are used both in DNA and RNA. And so uh, DNA and RNA both have adenine and guanine. These names are usually shortened down to C, T, U, A, and G. There is a slight difference in the sugar between RNA and DNA. Um, RNA is, um, uses a sugar called ribose and DNA uses one called deoxyribose. They're almost identical. This is a little bit like um, where's Waldo? Where's the difference between ribose and deoxyribose? Um, they look almost identical to each other, but if you look closely at carbon number two, the RNA or ribose sugar has an OH at carbon number two, whereas the deoxyribose used in DNA does not have the OH. There's no oxygen bonded to the second carbon. If you, um, if you want to make a polymer of nucleotides, in other words, you want to make a nucleic acid like DNA or RNA, um, then you're going to need to order your, nu your nucleotides in a certain order called the primary structure, similar to amino acid order being primary structure of proteins. To join these together, we're going to need to use another kind of polymer, uh, polar polymerization reaction. Um, and we're going to need to make some kind of bond between these nucleotides. And the name of the bond between nucleotides is called a phosphodiester bond. It uses the number three carbon on the sugar of one nucleotide and it takes the OH or the hydroxyl group on that number three sugar and it bonds it using an ester bond to the phosphate group on the number five carbon of the second nucleotide. Look at it again with pictures. Starting on the left, the top sugar, uh, the top uh, nucleotide there, the number three carbon sugar has an OH pointing down. And then the number five carbon on the um, nucleotide below has a phosphate group attached to it. We are going to link them up using the OH on the sugar of the first nucleotide with the phosphate on the uh, number five carbon of the second nucleotide. So on the right we see what they look like connected. Uh, so instead of um, just two separate molecules, we've now linked them with the phosphate of one of the uh, two nucleotides attaching to the number three carbon on the sugar of the other nucleotide. Notice this places the bases in a similar location to each other on the right side of the molecule. Now when you begin to uh, put more and more and more nucleotides together into longer and longer chains, they all bind together this way. Uh, a few questions we could ask. Um, first of all, let's review what is the bond called that links up amino acids. If you said peptide or amide bond, you would be correct. What is the bond between nucleotides to make up a uh, nucleic acid polymer, that's actually called the phosphodiester bond. So don't get those two mixed up. You want to remember those names of those bonds. Now, how does transcription and translation allow the nucleic acids to ultimately make proteins? 
Uh, first of all, we need to look at how DNA, which is a double helix, um, a double um, uh, a double strand, I guess I should say, a double strand, um, how the two strands of DNA zip together. Uh, the P's and the S's here are showing the phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar backbone of your DNA and of course branching off of those each pair you have a nitrogen base so those would be G, C, T, and A. Uh, remember uracil is not used on DNA, it's, thi uh, it's the T. So this would be half of the ladder that makes up the double-stranded DNA. Now you would want to use a complementary uh, base to attach across the ladder to make this a, a full ladder. You would need to use the complementary base um, on a different uh, strand. Now, What do we mean by complementary base pairs? Adenine and thymine are complementary base pairs. Adenine and thymine both form two hydrogen bonds. And so adenine fits with thymine by forming two hydrogen bonds to thymine, and thymine fits with adenine by forming two hydrogen bonds with adenine, shown here on the bottom left in um, uh, blue dots there. Those are the hydrogen bonds. Um, the complementary base pair for guanine is cytosine, and cytosine and guanine match up because they form three hydrogen bonds. So guanine doesn't attach to adenine or thymine across the, uh, the ladder. Uh, it'll only attach to cytosine. So if you have a guanine on one side, you have to have a cytosine on the other. If you have an adenine on one side, you have to have a thymine on the other. So those are the complementary pairs. A links to T, G links to C. So we go back to our ladder with our G, C, T, C, A, G, T, G, A, A. The complementary pairs would be G would be C, C would be G, T would be A, and so on. And then of course those nitrogen bases would also have a phosphate sugar backbone attached to those. And so you can see here, kind of on its side here, we have a completed ladder. Um, everything is covalently bonded except for the two um, hydrogen bonds between A and T and the three hydrogen bonds between G and C that sort of connect the ladder across the rungs of the ladder. Now the ladder is not flat, it actually um, twists uh, kind of like the picture on the right here and creates a double helix. And so it just, just kind of looks like a twisted ladder and the purple it represents the um, uh, sugar and phosphate backbone and then the C's and G's and A's and T's show the connections of the rungs of the ladder using hydrogen bonds either three for C and G or two for A and T across the uh, across the ladder and the ladder twists and you have this double helix which is the classic shape of the uh, DNA. So if we check ourselves on this write the complementary base sequence for the matching strand in the following DNA section. So if one half of the DNA looks like AGTCCAATC, what would the other half of it look like that would hydrogen bond pro appropriately as complementary base pairs? It would be TCAGGTTAG. That would be the complementary base pairs for A, G, T, C, C, A, A, T, C. So T always goes with A, C always goes with G, and vice versa. Uh, just as a little side note here, uh, DNA has the ability to copy itself or replicate. This is necessary if you're going to split cells in order to uh, grow new cells. You're going to have to be able to make two copies of a single DNA. Um, uh, molecule and so this happens because the uh, DNA has the ability to unzip at the hydrogen bonds and then form a an extra um, 
second half to each each molecule by growing the complementary uh, base pair um, equivalent there uh, they can end up becoming two identical copies of the same um, double helix um, and that's what happens during a cell um, uh, cell reproduction is the uh, the replication of the uh, of the DNA there. The DNA strand unwinds, each parent strand bonds with new complementary bases and you end up with two new DNA strands that are exact copies of the original DNA. Now that's replication. Um, why do we need all this DNA? Well your body um, has various proteins and the coding for those proteins needs to be encoded in that DNA. Your human genome has about 20 to 25,000 different genes and each gene is going to code for either one or a small group of similar proteins. The gene is going to have all the information required to make the protein uh, encoded in the order in the primary structure of its, uh, the order of its nucleotides. So the order of the nucleotides is important because it is that order that is the code as to how to make a, a particular protein. Uh, the basic um, foundation of turning DNA code into protein is that the information in the DNA code gets transcripted to messenger RNA, mRNA. Um, this is necessary because DNA cannot leave the cell nucleus. DNA cannot pass through the nuclear membrane in the cell nucleus. Uh, proteins are made in the cytoplasm. And so how, does, how do we take the message from the DNA to the proteins? We use messenger RNA. And so the double-stranded DNA gets copied onto single-stranded messenger RNA, which leaves, the nuclear leaves through the nuclear membrane, goes out into the cytoplasm, finds the ribosomes, where the ribosomes will read the information on the messenger RNA and translate it into the order of amino acids that need to be to make the protein. So RNA is transmitting information from the DNA to the cytoplasm to make the proteins. There are several types of RNA. The messenger RNA is what's carrying the genetic information from the DNA to the ribosomes. Transfer or tRNA is bringing amino acids to the ribosome to make the protein. So there's 20 different amino acids, so there's 20 different transfer RNA types. Then the ribosomal RNA actually makes up two-thirds of the ribosome where the protein synthesis is taking place. So the three types are M, T, and R RNA. Now if we start with um, getting the information off the DNA and onto the messenger RNA, you'll have a section of the DNA that unwinds to expose um, the order of the DNA bases. These become a template. The messenger RNA will be synthesized. It will not copy the template. It'll actually use complementary base pairing. So if the template has a, um, a T, um, then the uh, the messenger RNA will have an A. If the messenger RNA has an A, or the DNA has an A, the messenger RNA will actually use U instead of T. So that's the only difference, is instead of translating from A to T, uh, messenger RNA translates an A to make a U on the messenger RNA chain. Once uh, the messenger RNA is fully synthesized, it moves out of the nucleus and into the ri uh, cytoplasm where it finds the ribosomes and becomes uh, red to make the, the protein. So here's a little bit of a diagram of this. Um, we have the nucleus where um, the, D the DNA is stored. The DNA, you can see, has split open in the middle to expose the gene. The gene is the order of the uh, nucleotides. Then in green here we see the messenger RNA which is copying the information from the gene as the complementary base pairs. So when the, uh, the DNA says A, the messenger RNA says U. When the DNA says G, the messenger RNA says C. 
Now the messenger RNA, because it's only single-stranded, can pass through the nuclear membrane and go out to the uh, cytoplasm where it can uh, be used at the ribosome uh, in the process we call translation. The ribosomes are the protein factors. So here's the ribosome, the protein factor. Remember it's two-thirds RNA itself and so it can interact with RNA quite easily. Um, if we uh, go through the steps here, um, the incoming uh, messenger RNA gets attached to the ribosome and uh, much like um, how a, uh, a piece of uh, uh, receipt paper passes through the, uh, the, cash, uh, the cash register, the uh, messenger RNA is going to be pulled through the ribosome and as it's pulled through the ribosome the information on the messenger RNA is read. It's actually read as a set of three um, three letters uh, G, C, C and this particular diagram is being read by the ribosome. Now why do you need three letters? You need to code for 20 amino acids. One letter can only code, uh, using one letter you can only code for four amino acids because there are only four letters in messenger RNA that's A, U, C, and G. So you can't use one letter because that would only code for four amino acids. You can't use two because the combination of 4 and 4 is 16 and 16 is still not enough to make uh, um, a 20 different amino acids coded for. And so you use 3 amino acids or 3 nucleotides to code for a particular amino acid. It's a little bit redundant because 4 times 4 times 4 is 64. Um, so you have more um, more codes than you need, but you do have enough to code for 20 amino acids. Um, plus, have a start and an end um, to your amino acid and have that coded in as well, as we'll see in uh, future slides. So, uh, the, um, the messenger RNA is going to attach to the ribosome, and then the tRNAs, uh, shown here as sort of a funny little shape with um, three letters on them, those are then going to match up with the particular information on the codon to give you the appropriate next amino acid in the sequence to grow the polypeptide or chain or the, or the protein. Um, so as the messenger RNA moves through the ribosome, then each new set of three letters gets read and the next appropriate amino acid gets added to the protein chain. So it's a very uh, elegant process here. Ribosome binds to the messenger RNA and the uh, ribosome is going to read the code on the messenger RNA and it's going to grow the protein with the proper order of amino acids, with the proper primary structure. So the way the code works, the code is a sequence of nucleotides A, C, G, and U in the messenger RNA that determines the amino acid order in the protein that's being made. Um, it consists of sets of three bases, triplets, which are called codons. Um, there are different codons for each of the 20 amino acids needed to build the protein. And so it reads a codon and that determines which of the 20 amino acids goes next. And the transfer RNA is going to bring the appropriate amino acid um, to match up with the codon. You also have other codons that signal the start and the end of the polypeptide chain, so there will be a portion of the messenger RNA chain that is not used. Um, you only start making the proton, uh, protein when you get to the start codon, and then you stop making the um, protein when you get to the end codon. Um, I'm going to pass this out in class. This is the um, uh, the codes, the codons that go along with each of the 20 amino acids. You should practice using this on the homework and uh, using the first letter and the second letter and the third letter to find a particular codon and then match it with the, uh, the appropriate amino acid that's going to go next in your protein chain. Uh, these would be codons found on the messenger RNA. Uh, notice that it includes the methionine 
or start codon in green here on the left as AUG. So when the uh, ribosome finds the AUG signal on the master RNA, it will start building the, proton, uh, the protein. And then if it finds any of these three codons, UAA, UAG, or UGA, it will stop making the protein. So it tells it when to start and when to stop adding amino acids. Um, and the stop codon signals the end of the, uh, the protein. Let's test you so far on your understanding. Um, let's say these are the amino acids in a messenger RNA. Can you find on the piece of paper um, on the, uh, the code on um, uh, reference sheet what the appropriate amino acids would be? So CCU lines up on the sheet with PRO um, AGC is SER, GGA is GLY, and CUU is LEU. So just be able to find these on the um, on the sheet and determine what comes next. And so, whereas a messenger RNA has this particular order, CCU, AGC, GGA, CUU, the ribosome would read that to mean that pro it needs to form the protein in the order pro, ser, li, and lu. Now how do we get the appropriate next amino acid in the chain? Well, those are brought in by the transfer RNA. So the transfer RNA has two important parts to it. It has an acceptor stem where it attaches to the amino acid. Uh, this one happens to be attached to serine. And then it has something called an anticodon, which is complementary to the codon on the mRNA. And so it is able to um, line up uh, A with U, G with C, U with A in this particular case. Uh, if you go back to your chart, uh, UCA on a messenger RNA corresponds to serine. And so the transfer RNA that has serine attached to it and will put serine next in the protein has an anticodon of AGU that lines up with the codon on the messenger RNA, UCA. So each tRNA has a triplet called an anticodon that complements the codon on the messenger RNA and it bonds to a specific amino acid at the acceptor stem and brings the appropriate amino acid next in line to uh, form the protein chain. So we call this translation when uh, you take the information on the messenger RNA and you grow the protein. So the messenger RNA attaches to the ribosome. The start codon is going to bind a methionine um, to start out the amino acid, your tRNA with methionine will come in. Then the second codon after the start codon is going to be the next amino acid and so on and so on. And you'll keep growing your protein chain longer and longer until you reach the stop codon. And once you get to the stop codon, um, the formation of peptide bonds between amino acids will stop. Um, after all the amino acids are linked, you reach that stop codon, which is either UGA, UAA, or UAG. And since there is no transfer RNA that um, has the anticodon to match up with the stop codon, you can't add any more um, amino acids. And that breaks the chain, it clips off the chain, and then the polypeptide is going to be broken free from the ribosome and then it can fold up and form the protein it needs to be and then it can be in the cell. So a summary of translation is the messenger RNA attaching to the ribosome, the tRNA bonding to the specific amino acids and attaching to the codons on, using the anticodon attaches to the codons on the messenger RNA, then peptide bonds forming between the amino acid and the uh, carboxylic acid uh, the amine group and the carboxylic acid and making the peptide bonds in the peptide chain. And then the ribosome shifts to the next codon and it keeps adding more and more um, amino acids to the, uh, to the peptide chain. And then it reaches the stop codon and it stops.
polypeptide chain detaches and it's ready to function as an active protein. You've made a protein using DNA and messenger RNA and tRNA and ribosomal RNA. So let's take it from beginning to end. Let's say that this is a three codon code on some DNA. The DNA would unzip and grow some messenger RNA and what would its sequence be? Well GAA, CCC, TTT would end up being CUU, notice not T, but U on messenger RNA, CUU, GGG, AAA, and so the anticodons on the tRNAs would be GAA would be the anticodon for CUU, CCC for GGG, and UUU for AAA. So then the amino acid order in the peptide, based on our chart, remember you don't use the anticodons, you use the codons on the mRNA to determine what the amino acid order is for CUU. That would be LEU, for GGG that would be GLY, and for AAA that would be LYS. And so based on that original set of three letters and three sets of three letters in the DNA, you end up making a peptide which has the order blue lye lice. So what happens when it doesn't work right? When it doesn't work right, you have something called a mutation. A mutation is when the nucleotide sequence that is coded into the DNA gets altered. This can be from certain chemicals or radiation called mutagens, things that mutate the, uh, the DNA. And what it can do is it can cause misspellings in the DNA, which can cause misspellings in the messenger RNA. And you can end up with some incorrect codons. Um, so you get incorrect information, misspelled information, um, being uh, taken to the ribosomes. This can make end up making a protein that doesn't have all the correct amino acids, and as a result, it may not have the right shape and may not have the right function. So you might end up with a defective pro protein or enzyme, um, protein enzyme, and then that can affect the ability of the cell to uh, uh, thrive or survive. These are called genetic diseases when you have um, uh, incorrect spellings in your DNA and RNA. Genetic diseases like lactosemia, cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, muscular dystrophy, Huntington's disease, sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, and Tay-Sachs, and PKU or phenylketonuria. Now there are two main kinds of mutations you should know about. To illustrate these mutations, we're going to uh, change from A's and C's and T's and G's and U's to um, actual letters, uh, thinking of it like spelling here. These are three letter words and they give a certain amount of information. So these three letter words right here say the fat red fox ate the big rat. So it's a series of three letter codons that give us a certain amount of information. This is the non-mutated form. This information is correctly spelled and correctly written. The fat red fox ate the big rat. That's no mutation. If it had a type of mutation called substitution mutation, it would mean that one um, nucleotide is, is replaced with an incorrect nucleotide. For example, if the T in fat was replaced with B, just one nucleotide wrong in the order, the meaning changes from the fat red fox ate the big rat to the fab red fox ate the big rat. And so you can see that it affects the meaning of the sentence. In a similar way, it might affect the shape of the protein. A more serious kind of mutation is called frame shift mutation. In frame shift mutation, a particular um, uh, nucleotide is lost, and so it gets skipped over or it's lost from the order of nucleotides. This can drastically alter 
the protein and maybe make the protein so it will not work at all. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe with substitution mutation, the protein works poorly, but with frame shift mutation, the protein may not work at all. For example, if you take out the T, everything shifts over one, and instead of the fat red fox ate the big rat, it becomes the far edif oxa tet heb igger at, which is a very different meaning. Um, in fact, it doesn't mean anything. Um, I've got a question for you. Let's see if you've understood the order at which things occur chronologically in protein synthesis. If I gave you A, B, C, D, and E here, A being the messenger RNA attaching to the ribosome, the ribosome moving along the messenger RNA to add amino acids to the growing peptide chain, a completed polypeptide being released, tRNA brings an amino acid to its codon on mRNA and DNA produces mRNA. These are all steps in the protein synthesis. Can you put them in the correct order? What is the order that these occur? Uh, do that and then go on to the next, the next slide. The correct order would be first the DNA produces the messenger RNA. Then the messenger RNA travels from the uh, cell, mem uh, cell nucleus to the uh, cytoplasm where it attaches to the ribosome. The tRNA is going to bring the appropriate amino acid to the codon on the messenger RNA. And then the ribosome is going to move along the messenger RNA to add more amino acids to the growing peptide chain. And then finally, once the stop codon is reached, the completed polypeptide is released.